This is Investing Ideas by ValueInvestAsia.com. Hi, this is Stanley, and welcome to another episode of Investing Ideas. This week, my special guest is Sudan. Sudan is one of my ex colleagues back in uh, the Motley Fool Singapore. And uh, currently, Sudan is now a contributor to Sydney. Yeah, and he is also a co writer of the book Invest La, an average Joe guide to investing. So if you have not heard of that book, definitely do check it out. And uh, today, Sudan is going to share with us one hidden gem, which is listed in Singapore Exchange. I would not uh, tell you guys what is the stock at this moment, and I'll let him review it on his own. Without further ado, let's get started. From ValueInvestAsia.com, this is Investing Ideas, where we talk to investors from all walks of life, learn from them, and find out some of their favorite investment ideas. This week, we have a great guest uh, and a great friend of mine, uh, my previous uh, colleague at the Motley Fool Singapore, uh, Sudan. He is currently now the contributor at Sidley and also the co-author of the book Invest La, Average Joe Guide to Investing. Hello, Sudan, how are you? Hi, Stanley, I'm good. How are you doing? Good, very good. Today, you have a very special company to share with us. But before we jump right into the company, right, um, why don't you share with us a little bit what, what are you currently doing now at Sydney and uh, yeah, how, how are you contributing to the invest, uh, investing community right now? <laughs> okay, um, so as, as you know, Stanley, I was uh, your ex-colleague at the Motley Fool. Mm. Yep, and uh, yeah, recently the Motley Fool uh, Singapore clo- just closed down. Yes, so, everybody heard, yes. Yep, so fortunate to um, go to go on to um, write, write on companies and, and invest uh, stocks for, for Seedly. So, yeah, I'm excited to have this new opportunity with Seedly. And, um, yeah, but at the same time, if you like to lo- learn more about investing, you can also check out Seedly's blog at uh, seedly.sg. Great, great. Yeah, we definitely put the link down below for you guys as well. But let's jump straight into the main core of why we are doing this uh, episode. Uh, Every week, one of our guests will be sharing one investment ideas that they have uh, been thinking about currently. And this week, Sudan, why don't you share with us which company you're looking at and why do you like it? Okay, the company... um going to share with you, Stanley, and the audience. Um, it's Micromechanics. So it's a company um, that's in the semiconductor industry. So okay. they design and manufacture high-precision tools and parts uh, used in the uh, semicon industry. So uh, these parts are consumable. So once you use them, you have to discard. So uh, basically, they um, supply parts that are used in the testing and um, assembly of the um, semi- semiconductor chain, a value chain. So basically, um, they have stuff such as rubber tips for, mm-hmm. okay, for, yeah, for for their semicon um, value chain and and so all these all these products are, are one off use so you have to whenever you use it and you want to have work work on a new part you have to replace the parts so uh, this kind of gives them um, the recurring revenue. Um, ah. Okay, okay. Uh, why why don't you share with us a little bit more about their business model? So. Uh, how have, have they been growing? Why don't you uh, share with us what's the business behind Micromechanics? So uh, Micromechanics is a great growth in the business. Mm-hmm. So, uh, but, but in the latest, latest FY, we just ended in um, June 20, 2019, um, they have slowed down the growth because mainly due to the uh, slowdown in the semiconductor industry. Mm-hmm. But um, over the long term, um, there's still potential for this company because um, as you know, uh, smartphones and Internet of Things, AI is all the raging stuff now, right? So, um, for the long term, uh, semiconductors will still be in demand, but um, for the short term, there's always cyclicality in, in this industry. So, um, short term headwinds, but long term, there are great prospects for this company. Right, okay, okay. And uh, are they only serving the semicon industry or they do serve other industries as well? Uh, I believe they only serve the semiconductor industry right now. Right. Okay. Yeah. So so of so that means that their sales is 
very dependent on the semiconductor volume. Yeah, that's right. Say. Yep, so uh, yeah, the semiconductor industry is like um, super volatile, not volatile, I would say, uh, mm. super cyclical. Mm. So yeah, it's ups and downs, a lot of ups and downs. And um, if you uh, if you don't believe me, uh, you can take a look at uh, Singapore's Deputy Prime Minister, Hing Sui Kiet. <laughs> he recently said that uh, despite the slowdown in the industry, the future of the global semiconductor industry remains bright. Right. And the demand looks healthy. So yeah, if you if if uh, Minister Heng is uh, is is the person to go to, then uh, yeah, I think I think this, this is a great company to uh, great see. industry to be in for the long term. Yep. I see. Okay. Okay. If that's the case, if it is in a very cyclical industry, how do we actually predict? You know, their sales and demand. How how do you actually look at this company? Uh, so, just mainly from the entire industry growth. Or? Yeah. So for for. Uh, for investing for myself in general, I don't really look at um, short-term demands. So I uh, look at the long-term demands. Um, uh, so even though short-term, the company might face headwinds, uh, I see it op- as an opportunity to um, buy more shares in the company if the, the, the share price were to fall, the valuation were to fall. So um, as long as there's long-term growth in the company, um, I would be prepared to hold on to the industri- uh, company through the cycle. Uh, so, and especially for micromechanics, they, they pay uh, great dividends. So it's like you're paid to wait um, while the cycle turns around. Right, okay. And they supply globally or are they only supplying to to uh, manufacturer here in Singapore? So the main three markets are China, USA and Malaysia. Okay. They also have um, sales in Singapore and the Philippines, Thailand, Taiwan, so some of the, some of the other countries. So in Singapore, their sales for 2019 was around 5%. I'm just looking at their financials and wow, their, their their profit margin is quite amazing with a gross profit margin of more than 53% and a net profit margin of 21%. Why is that the case? Um, does this company has a moat? Uh, why, why are they able to have such a high profit margin? One of the ways to look at uh, moat would be um, look at margins, right? So um, high margins would, would actually show, show that um, a company has pricing power so that's the case for micro mechanics, like you rightly pointed out, uh, gross margin of around 54% and um, net profit margin of around 22% for FY 2019. So some of the reasons for the high high margins is that they they are always looking to improve their their productivity. So they they have strategies such such as um, uh, reducing uh, setup time and having more highly automated machines and smart factories. Okay. So in the manufacturing industry, setup time reduction is, is a big thing. Um, uh, because I've I've experienced in the um, manufacturing line, so when you can reduce the setup time, you can um, do things faster, and you can reduce costs and stuff. So this gives the company a, a advantage over its rivals as well. If you can produce more parts within the, a, a set period of time, you basically have more output, right? You're more efficient. So um, that's I think that's what is going well for micro mechanics. And that shows in its high margins as well. So you're basically saying that they are able to research and R&D more into the efficiency of how they do things. That's why they end up having a better margin than their competitor. Probably that's the case. And also um, even simple things like putting their, for example, as, as the parts move through the uh, production, right, for, for their components, when they produce the parts, even having things near the near the machines uh, makes a lot of difference for example you don't have to travel like one minute to take a new part to put into the into their product so if you have it all just beside uh, on your arm's length right that makes a big difference in, in in manufacturing so i think they do a lot of all this um, lean stigma stuff to to reduce their cycle time and you know re- uh, reduction um, setup time Okay, I'm trying to try and find ways to challenge your idea right here. When you look at this company, because it's not a very large cap company, uh, how, how can you tell uh, how well they are, they are basically doing to their industry or to, to their competitor? Is there a way that you look at it? Uh, is there any comparable for this company? So um, Micromechanics says that there's no... Uh direct rival for for them because of their competitors compete in in specific areas of the semiconductor industry or what what the company offers so micro mechanics has this whole range of uh, products and services but um his competitors only have certain aspects of um, those products so 
uh, there's no one direct competitor for them. So that's that also gives them, I think, the the competitive advantage. Because uh, from my understanding, okay, these kind of companies, uh, when they produce customized tools or consumable for the semiconductor industry, isn't it that uh, almost any mach- machine shop should be able to do the same thing? Do yeah, so from outside, it might look like that, that way because anyone, it seems like anyone can make the parts, right? But what is hard to replicate is the the quality mm-hmm. and, and the cycle time uh, so basically, if uh, I want your parts, I want I want it in in quick time. Like let's say I want I want thousand parts in, in within the next few days. Mm-hmm. I would uh, if if a company can can meet my demand and at a at a low cost and a high quality. So uh, I would go with that supplier. Right. So uh, for micro mechanics, I think it has that advantage. It, um, it's known for its quality and its um, cost, low cost, I think, and cycle time as well. So. Meeting customer demand is, is very uh, important in this industry. Yeah. Right. Okay. You sort of feel that they are able to maintain this kind of profit margin even going forward and able to you know uh, convince their, their clientele to stay with them, right? Yeah, I believe so. As long as they uh, don't, do, uh, don't screw up basically. So I'm, I'm sure they can keep their, um, their, their customers happy. Right. Have, have yeah. they screwed up before in the past? Um, not that I know of. Hopefully not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. And, yeah. and how long has this company been uh, been around? So, uh, Micromechanics was has been around for many years. So it was founded in 1983 in Singapore. So that's right. like what, so many years ago, mm-hmm. and it was listed in 2003. So mm. they have a long listed history and long um, existence in 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 the industry. So um, I'm sure they would have been through many cycles and mm-hmm. emerged stronger from you know, each cycle. Uh-huh. And one particular thing I like about this business is that um, its balance sheet is very strong. Mm-hmm. So it is full of cash uh, with uh, no debt. So um, the last I know that uh, companies without any debt, I don't think they went bankrupt. So they have a lot mm-hmm. of cash, no no debt. So yeah, strong business. Wow. Okay. And so how are you seeing this company? Uh, maybe as a dis- disclaimer, you, I assume you own the stock yourself? Yep, I do. And okay, and, and you're seeing this as a growth company or as a dividend company? Uh, how do you see this company? I would say this currently can be classified as a dividend company. Mm-hmm. Like I mentioned, uh, dividend, so the yield is currently around 6%. Okay. So strong strong yield. Um, even if you take away the, the special dividend, mm. so 9 cents of uh, t- total ordinary dividends there by 1.73 closing price is around 5%. Okay. So it's 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 decent yield, five percent, um, uh, strong balance sheet, and even their if you look at their earnings, price earnings, it's around eighteen nineteen. But okay. that's on depressed earnings. If you normalize earnings, it'd be much uh, better. What do you mean by depressed earnings? Ah, uh? because uh, you you just mentioned that they are facing a slowdown. You mean the earnings has already slowed, or it's still slowing? Yep, so uh, the FY 2019 earnings have actually slowed down. Okay. Um, so it was just reported um, a few, I think last month or a few, two months back, the earnings, FY 2019 earnings. So that has already slowed down. So if you use um, that earnings, reported earnings, the valuation will be around 1819 PE. Mm-hmm. But if you were to normalize, I think uh, the valuation will be much, uh, the PE will be much lower. Uh, but if you're seeing this as a dividend counter, okay, I'm just looking through their dividend payout right now. Uh, it seems that they have been increasing the dividend payout uh, over the past few years from 54% in 2014 all the way now to more than 100%. Do you still think that this dividend is sustainable? Yep, so if you look at the dividend PR ratio itself, yeah, like, like you pointed out, it's gone up and even above 100%. Mm. So I'm wary of companies paying out more than uh, what they earn. Mm. But the thing is that if you look at the cash flow, free cash flow, um, they are paying um, much lesser than their free cash flow. Right. So, okay. and the company also said that um, they are confident, they are basically maintaining the 10 cent dividend as uh, given out in 2018 because they are confident of the business and the cycle and that it will, it will do well. Basically, the company can um, emerge stronger, basically. Wow. Oh, you, yeah. you mean that even even they are facing this slowdown, they have no plans to cut their dividend? Yeah, so they have no plans. So basically, they maintain a dividend showing confidence in, in the business and the industry. Okay, if that's the case... Uh, 
maybe the slowdown is not as bad as we might think. Because if we look at the global financial crisis back in 2008, uh, this company actually cut the dividend more than more than half, right? From yep. five cents to just two cents. So you don't see this as a risk that this would uh, happen again? Yep, I don't see uh, that as a risk. I don't believe uh, we will go back, uh, face the same issue we faced during uh, 2008, 2009. This, this slowdown is just, I think it's, it's, it's short-lived. Um, not won't be as painful as what we faced in 2008-2009. Yeah, and if you look at the dividend payout ratio in 2009, it was 500 yeah, percent. Yeah, so it was really not sustainable. So they had to cut dividends. Right. Okay. Yeah. How would this company be affected by the current macro environment? Like we look at the trade war, and we look at you know just uh, everything that's happening right now. Uh, what's your view on that and how, how would this company be affected? Their, their sales from China is, um, for 2019 was 29% in, in all. So, um, yeah, trade war between China and, and US might be on investors' minds. But um, in fact, during the 2018 AGM, um, the company said that there's no direct impact on the company's business from, from China because it only supplies to the manufacturers uh, within the country. So be they Chinese companies or multinational companies based in China. So they don't um, really export out of China. Right. Okay. So what, whatever business uh, that they serve, they actually have a local local machine shop right there? Yeah, that's right. And they serve within the country. Wow, that's, that's pretty interesting. What, in your own opinion, might be the risk for this, com- this company then? Yep. So the risk, uh, basically, is that the cycle, the I mean, the semiconductor industry doesn't um, turn around. So okay. it's a protracted um, downturn, um, structural decline. But um, I don't see that happening. Uh, yeah, like I mentioned, uh, we still use the smartphones, and mm. there's still uh, growth in in this uh, tech industry. So um, yeah. So all these all these smartphones and all the machines still need all the chips. Mm-hmm. that goes into all these uh, equipments. And valuation-wise, it's kind of low risk, I think, if, if uh, investors were to uh, look into this company. So from an in- income perspective, uh, they've got great dividend yield from this company. Mm-hmm. And valuation-wise, I don't think it's demanding. Okay. Yep. How, how would you look at the valuation? What is a fair price for this company, in your opinion? Um, as in, I don't really invest for myself when I'm uh, using... Um, no, uh, fair valuation and stuff. But I just look at the earnings and the dividend yield because it's depressed earnings, right? The in- earnings is much lower, mm-hmm. and because of that, the P is higher. Uh, I've never, I've not looked at the normalized earnings, uh, price to normalized earnings, but I believe it's it's still decent around at this this price. Maybe just on the last point, on trying to to challenge your idea here. Because I, f- I, I look at their past performance, right? And, and this company right now has a market cap of roughly 240 million uh, market cap. And okay. I just look at their past performance. Uh, over the past 10 years, it hasn't really grown uh, in terms of revenue. La, it hasn't really grown like dramatically fast. And if, you, if they have already been in the business for say 30 odd years, almost coming to 40 years, and they're still at this size. Do you fear that you know this is just how big the market is going to be for them? They might just become you know a, a non-growing company uh, in in the next few years. I think the company can uh, grow with the demand in in the semiconductor industry. Um, like like I think many years back, the industry was still um, much smaller. The semicon um, smartphones were not that uh, I mean not that prevalent. Compared to now, and but there's always talks about this uh, AI, IoT, and and um, wearables, right? So I think the next few years might might see uh, different kind of growth phase compared to the past many many decades. Before I let you go, if an investor is looking at this stock, how would you look into? Uh, how would you see this stock uh, in the, in the whole pot, on your whole portfolio uh, in terms of sizing? How do you size such a position in your portfolio? Okay, for for myself, uh, I so I I understand this is a cyclical industry the company's in, 
Um, so um, when I started buying the company, I bought very slowly. Like I didn't like go like, all in. Mm-hmm. So I, I bought it even slower than the other um, companies that I have, like more more stable companies. So um, so I try to uh, buy only like uh, twice a year. Okay. So I, I really was deliberately slow in purchasing uh, more shares in this, in this company. And also because I kind of knew that the industry was going to slow down. Right. So um, I purposely uh, paced my um, investments slower and kind of take advantage of the um, um, decrease in, in share price. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Yeah. You only uh, invest in it twice a year. Yeah. That's very disciplined. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Not many people can do that. <laughs> yeah. So even even for the overall portfolio position sizing, I didn't don't uh, I don't want this company to be too huge uh, uh, compared to my whole portfolio. So yeah, that's the reason also I pace myself. Yeah. I see. Okay. Just maybe just to give uh, all the audience a little bit more context. Why don't you share a little bit more about how you actually invest? Uh, what type of investor do you see? Uh, do you categorize yourself as um i wouldn't say i'm like a strict value or growth or dividend investor um, basically i invest in companies that um that can grow for the long term mm-hmm. and pay decent dividend and there's a huge market that they can tap into so uh yeah i think that's that's me probably like a modely kind of investor right. yeah. yeah and and how how many stocks do you do you own personally in your Currently portfolio I uh, currently, I have around twenty to thirty stocks. Okay, wow. Yeah. Okay, very very diversified, and uh, so so a stock like uh, micro mechanics will take up maybe like uh, two to three percent in your portfolio. Yeah, that's as, right. As that's reasonable. Small. Yeah, I see. Wow. Okay, that's, that's uh, pretty fascinating. And uh, thank you so much for sharing so much detail, not just on the company but also on uh, how we should actually think about when uh, when we are uh, investing and uh, sizing our our position. And so once again, this is a Sudan uh, contributor at Sydney. We will provide the link down to the Sydney blog so you can read some of uh, Sudan's work as well. Thank you so much for your time, Sudan. I think uh, this has been an extremely interesting uh, company and I think many many of our audience will, will definitely be checking it out very soon. Thanks, Stanley. Thank you for having me. And I uh, hope the investors, um, your audience like micromechanics as well. <laughs> <laughs> definitely. I hope to chat with you very soon. Thank you for listening. You can subscribe to our show on Apple Podcast, Google Podcast, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcast. If you are feeling generous, please give us a rating and review as well. This would greatly help other investors find out about our podcast. To access our show notes, please go to valueinvestasia.com slash investing ideas. And be sure to sign up for our email newsletter for more outstanding content and reports about investing. The show is for entertainment purposes only and should not be taken as investment advice. Please seek professional advice or do your own research when making any investment decision.